Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today I have a very unique and special guest. This man is blessing us and coming to the Gentleman Style Podcast stage and giving his expertise, his wisdom, his insight. He is a world traveler and he's been to 137 countries and he's been practically all over the world, explored every nook and cranny there is. And he's here and he produced a film, um, probably, hopefully, probably not his last film. But this film has got numerous accolades, numerous awards, and he's done this seemingly without issue. And this quality, this production, I've never seen before. And so I was gracious and precious, incredible to have him on the show today. And so you all won't want to miss what this incredible director is bringing to the stage. We're going to be talking about his film, Touch Kink, and the BDSM community lifestyle what gets people into it and he produced a film on it again that has been getting accolades after accolades and respected all over the globe so you won't want to miss one second of this man here we go Welcome to the Gentleman Style Podcast show, family. My name is Marcus, your favorite gentleman. And today I have Mr. Max Keery coming to the Gentleman Style Podcast stage. He's a first time director based in Montreal. Throughout his life, he's had the privilege of traveling the world, working and living in 137 countries, like I stated before, over the past 30 years, collecting experiences along the way. And his personality is bold, unapologetic, and it all comes out in this film he produced and, and and released and his beginning accolades after accolades and his view on life is really sculpting into a real work of art and he draws on his inspiration from his world from the, the world to and the device diverse cultures he's experienced and everything and it's culminated into this masterpiece this work of art we're going to talk about his film touch kink and it touches on the bdsm kink world fantasy world that is is growing and is an actual community of people expressing themselves just like this director in the truest way so help me welcome without further ado to the stage mr max Kiri. hello everybody thank you for having me marcus really appreciate it really appreciate you sir thank you for making time with being us today and <laughs> really clearing up your schedule. I was really impressed and happy that you were able to book so quickly. <laughs> you, like I was thinking, you know, you were going to be months in advance. I'm probably not going to get him. He's busy, but you, you made room for us. So thank you, sir. I really appreciate you. My pleasure. My Absolutely. pleasure. So diving right in, sir, you've traveled the world. And I, I want to ask this here, 137 countries. What were you looking for? What 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 caused this exploration? What were you seeking, and did you find it, if anything? You know, I think um, every adventure, whether people want to admit it or not, usually starts with running away. Whether you think you are or not, but you are running away from something. You're in an environment, you're in a place, you're in a world that doesn't quite feel right. So you run away from that. And all, along the way, you learn things you learn different perspectives and different ways to do things and eventually maybe you find people and cultures that resonate more clearly with you and then you start to run to something run to an idea run to uh, concepts once you've sort of broken out of where you know the box that you might have been in and seen the world that there's so many other boxes and it just lets you breathe a little bit and then you run towards what you learned so yeah Bunch of years of running away, a bunch of years of running too. How about that for an answer? That, that's that's honest, right? That's an honest answer. And I think more of us don't acknowledge that part in our lives that sometimes we don't know what we're looking for We and, and we need to get away, right? Staying in the same place at the same time in the mundane. There's numerous films just like yours about people having to get away. They have to get away from the nine to five. They got to get away from these four walls because you, you become trapped and you become enclosed and that is a detriment to the mind. And it seems to me that you needed to free your mind and explore. And so what, what was, what did you find 
out out into the world. 137 states is no small. Yeah, um, I grew up in a very small town in Canada, a thousand people. Everybody knew everybody, and you know, it just felt very claustrophobic. People were very had, had a similar kind of mind, fairly limited notion of what the world was. Um, they weren't bad people or anything, but they only knew the people that they knew in the world that they knew, and they had a fairly narrow sense of what the world was. And I just never really felt like I fit in. I, I didn't have exactly, you know, want to fit into that world. I always felt something was out there more interesting and that out there in the world, you could find places that people had alternative points of view and different ways of living. And uh, once I found that and realized that that was indeed true, you know, it made me realize, yeah, there's nothing wrong with living in any particular way, but don't ever think that's the only way. Don't ever think there's only one true, you know, uh, path you know there's different ways and people express their lives and express who they are through those different paths you you touch on something that i had to learn in college it was um sociology and understanding that your circle your truth is not the only truth there's more than one answer there's more than one way there's more than one belief system and the example they gave in school it stuck with me is cannibalism right Mm -hmm. To to me and probably others looking at that is like, oh, I can't do that. That's impossible. Eat another human being. But put yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. Grow up in that that community where can't eating the flesh is is normal. Sure. And they grew up like this. And so their mindset is different from yours. And it's not to say yours is better than theirs or theirs is better than yours, but it's just a different perspective. And Absolutely. A more a more direct one that people that's, you know, I don't know there's too much cannibalism going on in the world right now. Right. But, you know, in Korea, there is a price on dog meat. I mean, it's a very normal thing that people quite normally eat. It's not a, an unusual thing at all. It's like we, we pick certain animals that are within the, you know, generally the uglier ones, the cute ones we don't like to eat. But, you know, there's a few animals we decide, a few animals we don't. That's different in different societies as well. Some societies will, you know, eat a lot of different kinds of bugs. They'll, they'll roast them and they'll salt and pepper them. And, but yeah, absolutely. It's what you grow up with and what your society deems appropriate, but there is no fundamental, you know, uh, only, you know, one can only eat uh, this, this, and the other thing, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. It's what you grow up with and what's normal for you, you know? It's Historically, it's interesting. A lot of it is cultural. I was reading something the other day about how the reason Americans have more of an interest in like, uh, you know, uh, packaged cheeses and packaged products and frozen dinners and these sort of things is because after the war, uh, you know, the industry had built up this whole thing about making things could last forever and they couldn't, they had to figure out how to sell it. So they sold it to the local, the local population of America. So we're quite used to things being packaged and sterile and boxed and certain kinds of like unpasteurized is actually, I think might even be illegal in North America where Europeans the other way around. It's like, you know, they want it living. They want it smelly. <laughs> they want it fresh, you know? So it's, again, it's just uh, half these things are, you know, culture puts on us, like the, the government, you know, they, they, they wanted to sell us uh, packaged foods and cans and stuff because they had a lot of that going. So uh, they did. And we think that we made that choice, but even that was a matter of being influenced, you know? Very true. Have you ever tried dog meat or, or bugs or crickets? I, I, I have. I have indeed. Uh, it tastes a bit like kind of uh, any sort of venison. If you've ever had deer or something, it's a little bit uh, stronger taste. Um, wouldn't run out to try it again, but when in Rome, <laughs> um, I had zebra meat. I was thinking of it would have stripes. I had zebra meat in uh, in South Africa, and uh, I was curious if it would have stripes in it, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> was it good though? Good. It was very good, actually. That was actually surprisingly good. Yeah, yeah. Zebra was good. Uh, gazelle. Uh, Elephant, I, I was good, but I felt bad because I like elephants. But whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, in 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 South Africa, at least, uh, you know, pretty much everything's on the menu. You know, if it if it moves, you can give it a go. Yeah, and why not? Make, yeah, makes if I can catch it, I can eat it. If it's yeah, if I'm stronger or more powerful, I'm, I'm gonna eat it. That's huge, 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 huge. Yeah. Thank you. Have an incredible mind. 
that has traveled the world 10 times over and gained numerous insights. What inspired you to focus on the kink world and the kink community? Was it exploration for you? Was it a new world or was it something you you've had experience in before and said, let me, no one's doing this. No one's done a film, particularly a, a, a docu series or a documentary, right? We've seen the films where it's, it's on display, but never explained. Right. So what, what inspired mm -hmm. you and give you inspiration to take on this project? Well, for me, uh, exploring subcultures is the same as cultures. For me, it was a natural ex uh, extension of traveling to different countries. And when I was traveling to different countries, I would do promotional things for different travel companies. I would do promotional videos on, you know, come to here, try this, try that. So um, that was kind of how I paid the bills as I was traveling. And then uh, when I started settling back down, I one of the first people I met that was super interesting was a dominatrix. And I realized that for all my travel and all my experiences, I had a lot of misconceptions about what her world was. And she was just very, very compelling and interesting and uh, offered to introduce me to people. So the process started. And I don't know that it was going to be, a, it was supposed to be a documentary right at the beginning. It was more just an exploration. Uh, but uh, it just grew and I found the world more and more interesting. I love finding, I like finding out my own prejudices, my own like ideas of like, okay, someone's life is like this and realizing I was so far wrong. And when I find that, I'm curious to find out why I had these ideas to start with. So, uh, yeah, m more and more people and they were very sort of guarded people because there had been documentaries and things, but usually about how crazy people are. And it's frankly easy to make anyone look crazy if you want. And it's probably going to sell better actually if you do. So there's a temptation. So these people were, weren't, you know, uh, were a little nervous, but as they got sort of deeper in and by my questions and by working with them, they started opening up more and more and it just became more and more interesting. Uh, so to answer your question more succinctly, I was meeting a dominatrix by the name of January Seraph, and you know that started the process. I'm, I'm thank you for for saying that. Um, January Seraph is what introduced you to to the community. She was the first interaction you had that that kicked it off. That kicked off the inspiration. Correct. Um, Correct. For those that that don't know, she. Um, January Seraph it was a is it was a huge dominatrix and, and still is in, in depending on the industry and the circles you're in. And so um they actually she's unfortunately deceased. She's no longer with us um today. Um, but they did a memorial that I wanted to pay homage to Mr. Um, Max Carey today for because she was in the film. She she was in the film. So he I'm Mistress January Seraph. I began as a fetish model. Worry about losing a job, not worry about family members never speaking to them again. So that it's just a thing that people like. I think that people come to BDSM and kink for a myriad different reasons. Aspects of ourselves, other aspects of other people. It's a way to form a different kind of connection. It's a way to be seen for who you truly are. That was January Seraph again, a rest in peace. Sir, what was she like? Can you tell us a little bit about what, what was it like interacting with her? Because people have these weird notions, right? That dominatrix are weird people. They don't have families. They're, they're inhuman, right? So can you help give us some insight into what she was like first impression wise when you met her? As a real person, uh, very sensitive, very intuitive, very emotionally, uh, aware um very beautiful person and in, in, inside and out and uh yeah i think that was you know she was the the real driving force in the beginning uh, because it she really did feel exactly that that people kind of it's funny there's a double-edged sword if you become super famous is like i don't know it could be the, the the world's best bass guitarist and people will be shocked to find out maybe that you have cats and like to raise horses or something. But you, what you're, you're, but you're the world's most famous bass guitarist. You know, it's like there's a this double-edged sword of becoming famous for something is because sometimes people remember you, but they only remember you in the sort of one-dimensional way of whatever they're you're famous for, and forget that you're a, a human being that has more dimensions. And uh, we all seem to do it. Um, but uh, yeah, she was a very multidimensional, kind, sweet, caring person that really wanted to 
get the gospel of the uh, kink out there. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right <laughs> choice of words, but the, 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 you know, the, the lessons that can be learned uh, by understanding ethical and consensual kink out to the world, you know? Absolutely. Consensual, ethical. You're, 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 those are words that people are shocked about when they hear, when they, when they first hear about the kink community and, and your documentary is what? There's morals, there's values, there's a there's a code of honor here. Like, and it's really shocking. Even um, some aspects for me were really shocking. But I think my first interaction with the kink community was, you know, relationships, dating, coming across young women who were very open and very exploratory, just like yourself. It's open-minded, open-minded. That's the word, open-minded open to new ideas, co concepts, and feelings, even to the level of, of their body, right? Open to try different things. And so what sets your part? I'll say, I'll say what sets, what it sets for me, what sets your work apart from 50 shades of gray, because that kind of, that was like the shocker to the world. That's why I think it did so well in the movies, but what sets um, touch kink, your film apart from 50 shades of gray is because you actually explain it. You actually talk about it from real live people. This isn't some paid actor, right? Pretending to be a part of this lifestyle. These are real people with real heartbeats, real pulses, real, real human beings. And they're expressing to you, like, I'm just like everyone else. And I think that's what sets it apart from me and makes it more educational, which I love to learn, um, versus um, I'm I'm just gonna show you a bunch of sexual scenes. What 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 makes to you what makes your film different from the 50 shades of gray series well from what i understand that was actually originally written as a as a vampire story uh that uh, you know she there was this sort of rich old vampire that was tired of being a vampire but she tried to reform him and make him a nice person um apparently vampire movies weren't selling so they changed it into a sort of a kink scenario but it still basically stayed a vampire movie there was no negotiation there was no uh aftercare and then at the end it was kind of reinforcing stereotypes where it was like uh oh but you're only really doing this because you're damaged or something and i can fix you um so it was kind of insulting it's almost like telling um, a gay person that uh you you could be fixed you know it's uh, that there's something wrong with you uh you, you know you are it, it, it's just it was insulting where i tried to let people be who they are and, and show that again the only reason you know, kink is okay, is the circle. It's one of the reasons I have a big O in touch is that, you know, the difference between what you do, what we do is the circle being complete, whether the talking about it, the openness, you might find people very open about stuff. Uh, doesn't mean they necessarily want to do stuff with you, but they'll generally be very open about what they're interested in. And then the negotiation starts. And if you do consent and do some sort of play, uh, you keep going. And then at the end of it, you can, finish that and so how was that was that too much was it not enough that circle where it's that circle that makes it okay because if it's a line where you skip any of those steps then it's, you're basically abusing that person because you're not following up you're not really caring you're just sort of using someone so the circle uh is feeds and creates a you know an ethical ethical thing when 50 shades and those kinds of things they were there was no sort of attention to that at all it was like he wanted what he wanted she wanted what she wanted and they fought it out you know that's not really kink at all that's just you know <laughs> a story of conflict you know <laughs> it's torture yeah it's torture it, it it more aligned with the societal beliefs of what what kink was when actually there's a whole and and again your film educated me because i had no idea there was four um characteristics to kink Right. And, and so there's a negotiation, there's consent, there's play, and then there's aftercare. What is aftercare? I didn't, I, cause that was something that aftercare kind of, is actually, yeah. One of the most important things. And, and it's oddly enough, something people in the kink community sometimes forget. And it's just a simple checking in with someone afterwards was that, how was that? How was X? How was Y? And giving that person a safe space to say, well, actually, I didn't like it as much as I thought, or I wish you'd done this or done that, or I'd like to try more with you, or I think that was great, but let's call it a day. Just basically just following up with someone, 
you know, uh, the, it, you know, the sex thing used to always be like, you know, was that good for you? Uh, that's kind of aftercare, but and it, for some reason it was almost made fun of in movies and stuff where people would say stuff like that. But I don't think it's a bad thing, you know, um, at least in the beginning. It's always good to be, when you're interacting with someone for the beginning, don't, don't make any assumptions. Make as few assumptions as possible as you really know that person. I say, you know, you don't have to ask me that anymore or, or I'll signal in a different way or you know that person, then fine. But aftercare is that closing thing to make sure everything is okay, that, that you make sure that person can go back to the world. I, I met a dominatrix once I thought it was fascinating. She was saying how after her most intense sessions where she would maybe humiliate a guy or do some things to him that would really like scare most people um, and make him really like suffer quite a bit, you know, consensually, she would notice that as they were leaving, they would sometimes make kind of a little insult and kind of mm -hmm. under their breath. And she always let it go because in, in her mind, that was almost the aftercare because as he, before he gets, goes through that door, leaving this session, then he's got to go back to the real world. So it also kind of de uh, recompress or decompresses them again. So they can go in back into the real world. So it's, it, it's different things for different people, but you want to bring them back to where they started the best you can. So it means different things for different people, but it's a, it's a, but it's a thing that's super important to be conscious of. And, and that makes perfect sense, right? Because this could be a boss or mm -hmm. a CEO at mm -hmm. a company, and he's just been dominated probably maybe, maybe even the first time in his life. Mm -hmm. And now to reset the clock and to go back into the world and function, yeah. He has to be, he has to absolutely throw, throw some jabs. I need to throw some jabs so I can for for some people that that's what it is. For other people, be different, be different things, you know. But that certainly for some people. And incidentally, I mean, you should talk about what aftercare looks like when you're negotiating. It's like, okay, so you we're going to I'm gonna spank you, for example. Great, right, you're agreeing this okay. Now in that before you even get consent, it's also good to say, so what does aftercare look like for you? Do you want a warm bath? You want to, and you agree on that too. Maybe like, I don't feel like drawing you a bath. Uh, you know, I could order you a pizza if you want to. Okay, that's good. Like you, you negotiate the aftercare as well, but it should be part of that conversation. So once this, what does that look like for you? What do you need? You know, maybe you're someone that, you know, there are people that go through the certain experiences. You think that they would laugh and they cry and other people that you think they'd cry, they would laugh. You don't even know. You might be surprised. Someone, I've seen people take, you know, painful situations that have made me go oh my goodness and they laugh and it's a little bit weird it's like for me and not weird it's just like a little bit okay so what does aftercare look like for you when you're laughing you know <laughs> you want to watch a sad movie i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but you know you just don't make assumptions and, and i think that's the beauty of it is that uh, humans have amazing capacities we live millions of different ways and different cultures and different times and we all grow up with different backgrounds we all have certain things you know fetishes are often to do with things we grew up with. So it, it's almost infinite the number of things a human being can experience uh, and want to experience. So it's equally infinite how they might want to finish up said experience. For sure. For sure. That makes complete and total sense. I I, I, I love your, your thoughts on this, your brains on this. Because clearly you had to do this, right? You had to do mm -hmm. research. You had to partner with January Serif and then other partners that she introduced you from. But how, <laughs> I gotta ask, how in-depth was your research? Did you have, did you participate in any activities yourself? As yeah, your absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did, absolutely. Um, I'd always been interested in it in more of an academic, not an academic way. Um, part of that running away, part of that not fitting into my, my town is that I didn't really, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it. I, I just, um, I just didn't think they were doing things in a way that made any sense to me. Um, so I, and I, I just didn't really feel. I just felt like there was something out there, and I felt like I could do something else. I didn't really know what that was, yeah. but I've always been fairly dominant-minded. Um, I've always been the kind of person that just does what he wants to do, and then figures it out as opposed to someone that, um, you know, is more comfortable following the rules. So I usually just do it. And I realized, oh, well, that's a kind of dominance. And when I got to the kink scene, I was, well, yeah, that's a, a dominant mindset. It's always someone who's going to 
kind of do what they want to do and, and dominate the situation. And they're going to be kind of the leader in the situation. So once I started reading about kink laws and reading, it started answering questions. I used to think, why doesn't everyone do this? Why doesn't everyone travel? Why doesn't everyone do exactly what they want? And then I realized that most people just aren't wired that way, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so from that point of view, what I re- realized, I mean, kink is a funny word. I mean, you might as well say Bob. Yeah, everyone has a kink. I'm sorry, they do. Uh, you know, it, it's like saying you have a life, you breathe air. It, it's, it, it's a funny expression. We've come to give it various definitions, but even the most common definition of a minority interest doesn't particularly work anymore because pretty much everybody's done a little bit of light bondage. So I guess bondage is no longer kinky. Uh, you know, it might be kinky to have sex with lights off now because most people probably do it with lights on. You know, it's like it's sort right. of a silly, silly word to start with. But yeah, just getting into it, realizing that I was sort of by nature that kind of person. And in my relationships with women, I'd always been that way. And I was learning more about the practices of kink, of just getting clear. And, you know, we as men are growing, grew up in a generation where I think, uh, you know, the rules are up in the air right now. How are you supposed to interact with romantic partners? You're like, are you supposed to be this guy? You're supposed to be dominating. You're supposed to be this. You're supposed to be that. And there's no sort of set of rules anymore. So for me, the solution was, well, here is what I like. If you don't like it, I appreciate that. No harm, no foul. I'm not going to judge you and hopefully you won't judge me for liking this. If you do, great. Just being very upfront about these things. And I realized, well, that's a great way forward for all of us, isn't it? It's not that you can't smack someone on the ass anymore. You just have to make sure that person wants that, consents to that, then fine. doesn't mean everybody can do it. That person is consented for you to do it. And between you two, it's fine to smack that person on the ass and say, hey, sugar tits, have a nice day. Because that's something you've agreed to. doesn't mean all women should be treated that way. All you can treat anybody else with that. You just between those two people, that's cool. You know, and I think that's the way forward. I don't think there's any universal rules left. So, yeah, kind of having that mindset of, of talking and trying to establish things. And, and also when you travel to different countries, it's like that too. I mean, in, in most of the Arab world, if you want to show appreciation for a good meal, you let out a nice big burp at the end of the meal. Um, where if you did that, where I grew up, they'd think it quite rude, you know, in, uh, in, you know, English cultures, you always have to finish everything on your plate in Asian cultures. You finish everything on your plate. It's a, it's an insult to your host. You know, it, it's, tipping. you have to sort of, you have to tipping. Yeah. Oh yeah. It could be a big insult in some places. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's so many things. So you, you learn the rules in your little community and you, follow them but you also go recognize they're just rules how about we live this way well still when we go out to public society if we're in this society or that we will play by whatever the general rules are but between you and i we know that they're just sort of <laughs> arbitrary you know that's huge and that, and and i love how you you shifted that that paradigm and you you, you broaden it because life is a negotiation right life is a negotiation mm-hmm. and it's a give and take it's a consent you're constantly seeking consent. So when you travel overseas, you have to get consent. And if it's not something you're willing to do, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't go there. Oftentimes I think Americans, they want to go and it's like, I'm American. This is the way it is. And that's not, that's not, you're in my house. So Mm -hmm. consent, you need to, you need to be okay with what I'm okay with. Yeah. I think that's honestly, people often give the Americans a hard time, but I think more of that's just young people, anybody. I mean, you've made Brits and Germans and Italians uh, in 20 something arriving everywhere. And they're like, well, why is this not like Rome? You know, where's like, how come I can't get good pizza here? I mean, what's wrong with this country? I mean, everyone is when you're young, you're, I don't think it's uh, anything to do with one. The United States often gets sort of knocked over the head for the, but just because there's so many of them. You know, you never hear about Luxembourgers as bad travelers because there's only 200,000 of them. You know, <laughs> if there's 300 million of them. You might, they might have had a chance to build a bad rap, you know. Uh, so, no, I think it's more to do with the young. And I think most of life's problems are, it's just, it's just ignorance. It's just people not knowing. You know, I, I grew up in such a white town that I didn't meet a black man until I was like 20. How am I supposed to know really? anything about, but uh, how, yeah, how am I supposed to know anything about black culture? You know, I did like nothing. You know, I grew up in a in uh, British Columbia, where there was a huge, it still is a huge uh, Asian community. I think it's like a third now from from Asia, from Hong Kong and China. So of course, you know, I know all, all sorts of stuff about you know Chinese food and culture and how different the variations from Vietnam to 
Shanghai to Hong Kong because these are my friends I went to school with. So we had those conversations. But uh, you know what you know until and you, you don't until you travel and get to meet people from other countries and and have conversations with them and to hopefully develop the kind of connection where you can ask them maybe questions that are a little uncomfortable. I remember being in the Middle East and I developed a few male friends and I, when I finally met their wives, sometimes they would be completely covered. And I would say to them, look, I, I don't want to be offensive. I'm just curious, like, why do you do that? Why do you make your wife wear that? And what I thought was interesting is in the three cases, it's only anecdotal, but in the three cases that I talked to, they all said they didn't, they hated it. It was always the mother, the mother trying to protect the daughter, have her thought of as a good person. Most of the men would rather that they were a little bit more progressive, but you know, at least that's the case in Lebanon where I, where I was visiting at the time. So it's like surprising, you know, you thought, oh, it's this guy, he's got, he wants to do this. It wasn't generally, it was that mother probably loving her daughter and wanting to not anyone to think ill of her. It'd be like an American not wanting her kids to go out wearing lingerie. You know, it's like, well, people are going to think bad of you if you do that and think bad of me. You know, it, it's just ignorance. It's just trying to fit into a set of rules. It's uh, cultural norms. You know, it's not good or bad. It's just kind of what people grow up with because they haven't been exposed to other things. So true. You know? So true. Yeah. And, and and we all need to get out more. We all need to get out more. Max mm -hmm. Carey, y'all. Huge. <laughs> huge, huge, huge. We have one quick commercial break. You guys don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be right, right back. Support for Gentleman Style Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers you precision engineering tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code GENSTYLE at manscaped.com. We are back to the Gentleman Style Podcast show. We have the man, the myth, the legend, this man here spilling the tea on his film, <laughs> Touch Kink. Incredible movies. If you haven't, if you guys haven't seen it, here's a small clip. Um, you got to go check it out. Not the trailer. But here's a small clip of what this man has produced and released, and it's getting numerous accolades across the globe. This is something that has the attention and the interest of a lot of people. That's where you are in this world at that moment. And there is no other place. And I'm curious, this is something that every woman I know would raise an eyebrow at and say, oh, I'd like to know more about that. A certain way to you does not mean that's how it is. Uh, uh, the way a drug would heighten your senses and make you feel euphoric. <laughs> I was so uncomfortable. <laughs> what do I do with this lady? I can't even begin to imagine. Are you scared? <laughs> In, very, very powerful. Mr. Carey, thank you for this. <laughs> this. This film really shines a light on the industry that again you you took the time you took the investigative insight and the wisdom and the open-mindedness to explore this community what challenges did you face in the production of the film what obstacles did you come across was it difficult to get consent from, from yeah people? um well it's the, the two it's uh, it's always money and access uh access was you know january introducing me to two people and you just talk to people and I think people can almost tell by the kinds of questions you ask. Like if you ask, so how has kink ruined your life or why are you messed up so much that you want to do kink? I mean, these are questions obviously showing the documentary is not going to, you know, is, is sort of put in a way to make people look bad. And mine wasn't like that. People could say like, oh, I'm, I'm curious, tell me what you like and teach me about it. And, and why do you love it? And tell me what you love. And people could just see by the questions that I wasn't trying to make them look bad. I was trying to learn what it was and trying to find, you know, what what, the, what are the big lessons? 
And for me, the biggest is again, that circle that, um, you know, being open and honest and negotiating and getting clear consent and, uh, and then playing and then following up with that person. For me, that was the, the most important thing is I see it in everything. Now I see it in business. I see it non kink. I see it everywhere in every way you should do that with everyone all the time, uh, to create any, anything meaningful in this world. Absolutely. What, what surprised you on set? Anything, anything about it surprised you? You seem very well-grounded and probably very little shocks you, but is it, was there any surprises in this? Um, I think, it was just, you know, having not met so many dominatrixes before and going to a convention where there was literally a thousand of them from all over the world. A thousand? Yeah, that's the world's largest convention. started the world's largest convention of dominatrix is called DomCon. They do it in Los Angeles every May by the hill, the, the hill summit by the airport. And a thousand, like, so from all over the world, Germany, Japan, Italy, Australia, Canada, the States, all over the place. So there's a thousand of these people. And, and, the audience, they look quite intimidating. I mean, these are like any one of them would make you go, okay, I'm yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, and when you have a thousand of them together, you're like, okay. And then you start realizing there's a whole variety. There's one dom that her whole thing was like the clown dom. She dresses up as a, in a clown. Other people are more into rope. Other people are more sensual. Other people are more leather and serious. But just the A, that they were far more approachable, far more open and honest than I expected. Uh, and it wasn't a question of like, oh, well, you, you know, get in a cage before I talk to you. It was, they talked to you the same way we're talking and, you know, you decide what you want to do. You don't start off with anything. You start as human beings talking. And I don't know why, I guess it shouldn't have surprised me, but it did to some extent how sweet and how kind and how amazing these people were. Uh, and I don't know why, again, it was like so many countries I've been to where I expected people to be one way and, and they were another way and you know obviously like some people some cultures are more like coconuts which is like on the outside it's hard to get in but once you're in your family and others are more like peaches it's very easy to get in but you can never really get to the center and one <laughs> might seem one might seem friendlier but the other would probably be the one to loan you 20 bucks if you needed it you know so it's just it, <laughs> seeing those cultures and getting exposed to those and seeing the sheer variety of it, I think surprised me. Um, and the generosity, the, the, the real like want for the world to understand a lot of these people have been doing this a long time. And this is, you know, uh, been on the fringes of society, shall we say. So some of them take heat for it, you know? Uh, so the fact that they were also oh, open and honest, I think was, was one of the biggest surprises. Absolutely. I think again, and I'll I'll say for me, the biggest surprise to me was that there was aftercare. I think I, I feel like my aftercare would need to be like I'd need a cup of tea, I need a bath, mm -hmm. and I don't want to see you for a second. Like I don't want to, depending on the the route that that you go down. But I, I feel like the aftercare would I would need some time to just kind of process and take it in, especially first time um, people. Um, going into this, how did how did you navigate the balance between artistic expression and not having this evolve into so, and and maintaining the respectful representation? How did you balance the two and it not turning into some pornography? Right? How did you balance? Um, sure. I shot probably I shot about five hundred hours worth of material, uh, something like two hundred fifty people, and I just focused on the people that I had the most story on, like. A lot of people I focused on and I follow up, nothing happened, follow up, nothing happened, the follow up, nothing happened. So I ended up focusing on the people that just something happened, you know, that uh, they had this issue or that issue, or there was some sort of uh, story, some sort of arc. Um, and, you know, it uh, didn't turn out well for some and for some it turned out really well. So I think it was just following the story as opposed to trying to prejudge and try. It wasn't, there wasn't a story I wanted to make. I wasn't trying to, I wasn't sure how it was going to end actually. Um, really? No, not really. I mean, I wanted to present it, but you know, I'm glad it's getting decent reception from the mainstream and the King community because in my mind, I mean, some of the people, you know, January past, for example, uh, the other people like Grace, who's now into it is, you know, happily married her subby boy and has two beautiful children and it changed her life for the better. So it's like, it's, it's just, 
I didn't know how those stories were going to go, but it was the stories that I got. And uh, so I decided to tell them with as much grace as I could. And there wasn't really any agenda other than that. It was, the only thing I wasn't going to do is the making all these assumptions like, why are you so damaged to be in this? You know, uh, I think somebody in the movie says that, you know, maybe some people are damaged, but everybody is damaged in one way or not. We're all working through something. Everybody's got maybe they got beat up at high school or they got this or they're not getting that or there's something that's like probably eaten at them. I don't know a human being who doesn't have something that they, they need to work through. And if they don't have something to work through, I almost feel sorry for them because that would be boring too. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. In the film, there was a young lady um, expressing to her, I think boyfriend or husband, I can't remember which, but she was expressing to him, like, this is something I'm trying. And, you know, and he's like, are you, are, we, are you going to bring this home? And now, and now the acceptance part in negotiation at home, but you know, um, just that change, right? She had to. Yeah, well, that was that was closer. interesting because I had met her years earlier, and I mean, I recognize a lovely lady. I met her in in, in India, and uh, I just recognized she's a very naturally dominant woman, just very much like traveling on her own, doing her own thing, very like, and you know, so we became friends. And when I was later thinking about someone who probably would be a dominatrix with, but doesn't know it. I remembered her and invited her to sort of become in this world. And of course the result was she did find out that she was very interested. And she also, it answered a few questions for her because she, um, she'd always found certain men, generally military boys actually, um, who really liked her because they kind of liked following orders to some extent. It's very much part of the training to yes, ma'am, no, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, very hierarchical, hi hierarchical. Um, and she, she always seemed to do quite well with those and like those. And so she, you know, her, her husband now is, you know, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say, but he's like a special, you know, he's up there, shall we say, uh, you know, and he, you know, he loves, he, he, you know, and it's his thing. And I think, you know, that he was always a little more into it than I think she knew, <laughs> you know, or maybe he, he felt it, but he couldn't articulate it either. Just in the same way I, I would say I've been, into BDSM before I knew what that was because I just didn't kind of do things the way other people did. And there's an extreme of that. There's some people that are more that way. Some people are like, I can't get out of bed without being told what to bed. They're so uh, submissive that they need to be told what to do all the time to be happy. So we're all on that range, you know? So I think he knew he liked to be told what to do and like to follow orders and like to, you know, make his superiors happy. You know, that was, that's just so ingrained uh, in someone like that, that it just, naturally flowed to his personal life too and they got married and they have two beautiful kids now so there you go it doesn't ruin families it doesn't ruin households understanding yourself never is a bad thing i mean if you, there are people that um you know it's it's not understanding yourself it's not being able to have uncomfortable conversations it's not being open that ruins things not being open you know and, and talking about these things and and uh, you know yeah, I, I don't think whether it's kink or for me, it's funny because I, I, you seem to be one of the few shows that's been sort of merging my travel and my kink because I've always seen it, it's the same thing. You you could travel to a different country, you learn the rules and how it works in that place. You travel to a subculture, it's the same thing. This is a subculture. Uh, you go to land of kink and even with the land of kink, there's many states, you know, there's a state of rope and there's the state of femdom and there's the state of spankos and there's the state of latex people. There's the state of, you know, there's a million different sub places in there subcultures within the subculture so it's just traveling to those worlds and understanding why why do people come together around these things you know you very true you express that you again and the awards and accolades speak for themselves but there's also probably some key people in your circle and other directors and other film producers what has been the overall response from from both the bdsm and the general audience closest to you since the film's release because this is out now this is out there. Yeah, it's been it's been quite good. I've, I've got a number of uh, really good reviews. Um, generally, it's been very well accepted. Um, obviously, like within within the king community, there are some people that are, their whole life is say like shibari is a huge thing now, just rope. So they rope might play. I don't feel particular. Yeah, rope play. It's all their whole. That's that is what it is for them. They they might not even consider themselves kinky. They just like shibari. You know, um, that's the other thing is too is like some. 
the words are so funny when you start labeling things because some people like the label and some people don't like the label. Some people prefer a different label. You know, I don't think there should be any labels at all. I think everything is spectrums, but whatever. I get it. We need to know, okay, I'll meet you on the corner of Smith and Main Street. We need some, you know, I can't say, you know, where the mood fits us. Uh, so it's, it guess it kind of gets us to the right area, but as soon as we're in the right area, I think we should get rid of the labels. But um, so, yeah, I mean, some, some community, like if they're really into one thing, like, oh, I, I don't feel necessarily represented, but people just getting into it. I've got, I've got standing ovations, you know, people just learning a little bit about it and wanting to know a little bit more and, it's it's encouraging them to at least explore a little bit. I don't be as afraid of it. What I often say, and I, I know it to be true, is as as a human being, especially as a woman, you're, you're safer walking into a kink party with everyone in leather and latex than you are going to your local sports bar. Because at that event, nobody's going to touch you. Nobody's going to do anything without your clear consent. Because it's so easy it's so hard to get a good reputation and so easy to lose it. You're that one guy that does something or pushes somebody and somebody's uncomfortable. You're done. And there's literally people that are called dungeon masters. And it's literally their job to throw people out if they violate the consent of somebody. So if somebody, somebody does something to somebody without their clear consent, they will be thrown on their ear very quickly. Really? And Oh yeah. So you are safer going into torture garden then you are going to, you know, your regular whatever you know, nightclub party, your regular nightclub. You, yeah, I mean, regular nightclubs. You, you hear women say, "Oh no, don't do this. You'll lead them on. Don't do that. Oh, don't take the drink because then he was like, you know, there's the rules. I've seen these rules. We're like, and you know, depending on the community, and trying to say, oh yeah, you can't do this or you can't do this or they'll expect that there's some sort of like code in that club that they do this, this, and this, and it means they have to do that. Where there's no such thing. In the completely so. Completely so. Yeah. So completely safe. Completely, I mean, okay, there are bad actors everywhere, but I'll say that there's a lot less. I would be quite comfortable saying there's a lot less in the kink community. Uh, it's unethical. It's un. It's, and there are literally people whose job it is to police. And as I said before, you know, uh, you're in a, you know, St. Petersburg, Florida, which popped into my mind for some reason. Yeah, there's a small community, maybe like 500 people or so, that's that's fairly consistent. And you want to be have a good reputation in that community. Otherwise, you got no one to play with. And light, bad news travels faster than good news. That's so, true. So, you know, you have to really behave yourself, you know. Uh, so, you know, that I think, I think again, you're you're safer at a kink event than you are at a, at a non-kink event because it's baked into it. It's baked into the event. It's baked into the process. You know, I'm not saying, again, not everybody's following rules. There are some people that are bad actors and anything, but for the most part, I, I would say you're safer. Yeah. That makes sense. And I, I didn't even consider that. If you mess up in the community and you're ousted, once that news gets out, what, what else do you do? How do you, how do you get, uh, like you said, who, who do you play with now? So you want, yeah, to you, you're, 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 yeah, yeah. It's really, really, really tough. And uh, the world is very, very small. And, I don't know that I completely agree with it, but people are like making little lists of people, you know, different communities like, Oh, we'll check if he's on the whatever list and this person's that list. And it's like their own, you know, uh, you know, things happen, you know, there can be miscommunications, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a world where you have to be extra cautious if you're going in thinking that, Oh, I can, get whatever I want. Yeah, you probably can, but it's not, it's not a question of just asking it and you're going to get, you have to really, you know, consider it and ask a lot of questions. And, uh, is there test clear about it? Uh, well, uh, this is a big sort of misconception about kink. Actually, for a lot of people, there's nothing sexual about it. Uh, so testing is irrelevant. Uh, a lot of people, I joke sometimes that people, a lot of people do sex to get kink. And a lot of people do kink to get sex. Uh, a lot of people just do kink. Um, it, it's, Kink in its purest form, especially with the old, old, like kink is like kind of like saying human activity. And below that on one side, there's kind of BDSM, which the old guard would say it's not really almost nothing to do with sex. It's, it's about sensation play. It's about enforcing different kinds of rule sets, someone dominating somebody, someone consensually doing this, consensually doing that, whether there's sex or not is relevant. And then under the fetish side of the kink umbrella is more, more sexual like okay we're gonna have we're gonna wear latex and we're gonna do this so we're gonna do that it's, it's a, and again it's not always but in i would say roughly speaking 
under the fetish umbrella, 80% is 80 to 90% is about sex. Under the BDSM pure umbrella, I would say only 10% is about sex. But you know, under the whole whole kind of kink umbrella, it's probably about 50 50. But it's uh, not all sex. So it's literally. Well, again, it depends what you call it. Yeah. There's no penetration. No, not always penetration. No, Sometimes no. it can be just, I'm here to get dominated and then leave. And that's the end of absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. And there are, oh. there are lots of people that want that, like that. I mean, there, there's whole communities around spanking that that's their whole thing. They just want to spank people and, uh, you know, learn techniques to better spank them. And some people like to be spanked and that's that. Now, the interesting thing about it is there are people that, okay, like spanking is a great example because, um, I could be a spanker and someone's a spanky and I'm spanking them, but I'm spanking in such a way that they may actually have an orgasm. They do. Wow. I don't, but I, you do it in a certain way to create a certain vibration. If you go kind of go up like this and you do it sort of masterfully and you can kind of like read the person's body language, people can, or you, know, you can make a woman orgasm, anyone I imagine, uh, orgasm just doing that. So is that sexual? I don't know. I mean, he had an orgasm does that there wasn't penetration was that sexual I mean, whatever and for the person doing it they're enjoying that power or enjoying the the fantasy or the control that they're having and they're obviously getting turned on by it there's an intense interest you know it's almost like it just it's a passion it's something that really, really drives them and it's an intensity is that sex i, I you know <laughs> if you say strictly penetration if that's how you want to define it then uh yeah i'll stick with my earlier numbers that's fair that's for huge learning something. It's it's an important distinction because even when you're this part of the negotiation phase, you're talking to somebody and uh, so, okay, you like to get, uh, we'll stick with the spanking example. You want to be tied up and spanked. Okay, great. And then uh, how does that look at the end? You know, I would like, maybe I would like oral sex or something like that. How do you feel about that? Oh, I, I love doing that. Okay, great. So how about we do that? Then I'll spank you. Then you, you give me head, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, yeah. okay, that's, that's how we're going to do it. Cool. That's what we've agreed to. Uh, okay. We both consented. Great. That's what we both, you know, or no, how about something else? Or like, you just talk about it and just have those open and honest conversations. Maybe you don't want to have, you're not ready to have that conversation. You say, no, I'll just thank you first for the first time. And maybe the second time we'll, we'll talk about more. See how we, we jive. It's like, it's a first date spanking, you know, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we'll, we'll wait for the second date. But everyone does it differently. What they're comfortable with at their speed. Um, generally people in, in the community are more aware of testing. Like, I, you know, I know a lot of people, if they are going to that, it's uh, myself included. It's like one of the first conversations I've ever had with anybody whenever I'm going in there is like, have you been recently tested? Have you got a whole health screen? I'll get my, I think there's nothing more romantic actually than, okay, we're going to do this. Let's go and, uh, you know, become like a virgin again, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Come start from that point, you yeah. know. Because so, now you uh, have you have someone, so now you can say, "Hey, let's take it a step further." Especially if you're crossing that line, all in the negotiation bubble. Yeah, yeah, you have those conversations then, you know, or you know, in, in aftercare, you can talk about, "Say, what do you want next time?" Well, next time, you know, what I you were doing this and that, and I was thinking this and that. Maybe this and that we could do next time. Yes or no? Maybe you know, but that's the time for those because you might not know what maybe you find yourself. Kinks are a funny thing. I mean, everyone's different, but for me at least, it's like different people inspire different feelings. Like some people, they say there's like bratty people, they inspire, they like to be a little bratty and push buttons. So the people are more subservient, other people are, you know, so like they make you interested in doing different things depending on the person. You know, maybe someone's a really heavy masochist and they really bring out the, the real kind of like, okay. You really want this? And I really been looking for somebody who can take this. Uh, so let's see, you know, they bring out different things. So you, you go through that circle and then keep going. And, you know, I, I don't think you should ever try and go too far, but my personal, whatever, I think you should be as open as you can, but close out a circle before you start another circle and those circles can get bigger. <laughs> Has it, was there any knife play or anything like that? Sword play? Um, cutting, yeah, um, anything you, like that? Yeah, a few people uh, that I, I, I think there's a little in the documentary, but I pulled out a little bit of that because. Uh, yeah. uh, I noticed that. Yeah, it was kind of like, it's hard to figure, needle play and blood play. It just, I mean, it makes me a little bit whatever too. So, and I thought, I'm pretty open-minded. 
certainly I saw a lot of it and a lot of people are into that. It's not my thing. And I think it looks a little scary. It's hard. And I didn't want to distract from the primary message of just follow that circle, understand the circle, whatever, whatever you get into, you know, try and learn as much. There's lots of practices within one community may not be considered safe. And within another community, it's, Hey, a number one, their favorite thing to do, you know, um, there's a whole bunch of different debates of what's safe. And sometimes it's, you know, things you might not have expect, you know, it's, you have to have those conversations. You have to learn. And certainly when you're doing things with knives or fire play and things like this, I really hope you know what you're doing. Fire play. Um, so the movie's out. This is available now today. Um, so you've gotten positive feedback. You've gotten a lot of positive feedback. Um, for any new potential viewers of Touch Kink, what message or themes do you hope those audience members that find it and, fi and find this interview take away from the film? What's, what's the goal there? What are you hoping that people um, conceive from this? I'd like them to visit the country that is kink and come away with some surprises and to open their minds a little bit and make them maybe curious about visiting that country and exploring that a little bit and not being as afraid of it as they might have and look for a little gold there and to yeah to sign up to the the newsletter if they're not already not there because i'm going to be doing a, a tv series about the same subject soon so go to touchkink.com and drop your email into my uh newsletter and uh stay up to date with uh, my kinky and sex positive projects what advice would you give to that that's huge what advice would you give to other filmmakers looking to explore more unconventional and taboo subjects any advice to other independent filmmakers that are they've always been curious to explore new endeavors but been afraid and now here you are breaking the mold breaking the barrier breaking open that circle what would advice would you give to them I would tell them quite seriously, don't do it. It's insane really? making insane in making movies. It's an insane process. Um, it costs a lot more money and a lot more time. And with the way the market is right now, it's sort of a, it's a long way of trying to say, do this because you really love it. Uh, because if you really love it, do it because my my musician friends always joke it's like you know we should stop calling it playing that's why it's hard it's so hard to get paid to do gigs you know it's when you do something you love um often you it's hard the, the path is hard and you have to recognize the path of the artist so if you want to do it um be ready for that you know be ready it's going to take more time more money you're going to have to get more creative you're going to have to do all those things and if knowing that doesn't stop you from doing it then go for it you know yeah. go for it you know, well, make all your dreams. Make all your dreams come true. <laughs> yeah, just be, just don't be unrealistic. You know, I think a lot of people, it's funny, I, uh, I read an article the other day, Sundance Film Festival had uh, 16,000 films submitted this year, full-length films, of which 25 were selected. By the way, that the, nice. the 15,000 films represent something in the neighborhood of $8 billion worth of production. $8 billion was spent making these movies. 25 were shown none made any money <laughs> what yeah yeah it's um why even do it <laughs> indie film is done because you're hoping that netflix or hbo or somebody a big big uh, company hires you and does your next one i mean you look at scorsese you look at some famous people have the same problem it's like they can't they, all the money they have they can't make a movie they need a studio because you know, what people don't seem to understand for every million bucks that they spend on a movie, they spend a million dollars promoting that movie too. And mm. they spend a million dollars on talent. So you, it's just more expensive than you realize. And then if you're connected with, a, a, you know, to CNN always does this thing, you know, affiliated with Time Warner, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they're promoting movie, other movies that are part of the family or in the family. You know, it's it, it's a, it's a business. So that's why people are going, well, how 15,000 movies made? How come I've only, I can't see a good movie? Because the movies you're seeing are the ones that are big studio movies that are being promoted, rammed down your throat. So as far as you know, that's the only thing you see. And everybody else that, you know, isn't part of the food chain is a lot harder to find. Independent cinema is alive and well, and it's out there, but nobody, very few people are, uh, are making money. I, I frankly make most of my money on consulting and doing uh, doing other things. You know, this was an exploration. It was interesting for me, but 
it's it's the the state of independent cinema is in rough shape right now because of the there just isn't a market you know the the netflix every does their own movies now if you get hired by them great that's you know developing things with them it's just the the ecosystem right now is is a little the old days you know you could get different distributions for different platforms the only platform that looks reasonably good to me right now is what i'm on which is called kinema which is an indie platform that's designed where I put a movie on, it's available to you, and you know they take ten percent, and the filmmaker gets the rest. Which versus, I'm on other platforms and they get ten bucks, and I might get a nickel. You know, <laughs> wow. You know, it, it's cool. it's it's an interesting world. It's an interesting world right now, uh, and uh, it's shaking up. I mean, it shook up when the streamers came in, and then it shook up with the internet. Now they're going back to this sort of model of. You know, you watch TV every 15 minutes, there's going to be advertisement, but it's on internet. So that back to that sort of model, the old broadcast model, that's slowly coming. There's literally thousands of those channels. They'll all take your movie, but they'll, they want to play, you know, a nickel every time someone watches your movie kind of thing. You know, uh, the, the, the ecosystem is, 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 is a little tough right now. And but now you're loving people do it. And now you're going live on podcast. Um, you know, blasting networks for, you know, Hey, my film gross this much money. And now you're trying to get back paid for how well and how successful, because you realized you were underpaid. That was something that I, I didn't even realize it was in the industry actors going back, going back to, um, I forget the, the industry basically saying, Hey, there's no protections. There's no the actors guild. That's what it was. The actors mm -hmm. guild, not they weren't getting compensated. Well, um, what was, what, what was touch kinks, um, budget? And did you surpass it? it yeah, uh, it cost about a quarter million to make. And it was, you know, two, three years of my time. So whatever that's worth. And I would say, no, I haven't, I haven't uh, come close to getting, recu recouping that. But it has given me, I've done a lot of ancillary work. I've been hired to do speaking engagements. I've been hired to do teaching. I've been hired to do consulting. I've been developing other projects. So it's sometimes it's a, uh, you have, it's like a, uh, you know, feather in your resume, so to speak. Um, and now I've been enjoying this now that it's available to the public for the first time. I'm enjoying doing virtual screenings where, you know, I'm getting people that I hadn't seen. I did 18 film festivals all over the world and it was neat getting up on stage and answering questions and stuff like that. But um, that's an expensive way to promote a film where, uh, you know, I can do that virtually now. So I'm experimenting with that, but I need to get the word out and let people know about it and to check it out and to check out indie, indie cinema. I mean, there's so much more than uh, than people realize, you know, uh, there's so much great stuff out there that, you know, maybe is pushing the boundaries, but it's, uh, you know, it's not mainstream enough that a mainstream um, house is going to take a chance. You know, Disney is not going to be putting this out alongside, you know, Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. It's not a. It probably won't be picked up by Pixar, um, um, Disney Plus, um, subscription. But you know, it, 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 it again, it shines a light. And again, you love it, right? Yeah, it was, that's it right. Was, I mean, that's it was that was like you, you when you were saying advice, sort of. That's why I was saying it's like just be aware of what you're getting yourself into, and accept that in your heart and realize that that's part of the deal. If you do better than that, good God, you know, God bless and and good for you. But you know, don't think that, you know, uh, it's funny because I remember when I first started applying for things, even just getting like a letter from Can going, oh, well, we're, your film was under consideration. Oh, my God, this is going to change my life. But then, you know, they sent out probably 14,000 of those letters. You know? mm. But in the beginning, you, you kind of have the delusions of grandeur a little bit sometimes at the beginning. And it's it's fun. I mean, you get paid in applause and you get paid in nice emails and reviews and stuff. But, you know, don't have it. You need to have you know, either figure out some way to have more of your budget covered through grants or through other things or get paid other ways or expand it a little bit. So the money's coming from various sources or something, do whatever you can do to not end up, you know, having a, like me having a little bit of a debt after, uh, after making a movie, you know, that's true. So true. That is huge, 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 huge. And, and what you said it earlier, but what do you have next? What's in store for you, Mr. Carey, because you're clear, you're young, right? Mm -hmm. You're young enough to do other things. What's next for you in the pipeline? Well, um, I have 34 different projects. The way that 
you know, it, it, one of the other things about having a film out and winning a bunch of awards and being a film festival is you're suddenly eligible for all this grant money. Uh, so now I'm pitching different projects to different uh, organizations and hoping that I'll get funding through those organizations. Um, but most likely it will be a 10 part series, uh, tentatively named the provocateurs or modern love. I haven't decided. Basically it's a 10 parts, uh, series exploring relationships from different points of view and relation, you know, how modern relationships work and how sort of like we were talking about at the beginning, how one culture may be different than the other. And it's important to know what rules we're talking about. Are we doing this based on, uh, you know, how it works in New Jersey or how it works in Sao Paulo? You know, before you know, figuring out the cult, the, those things, and then exploring and understanding that there is no uh, one way of doing things. Living in Quebec was is is where I am now. I, I find it interesting, and I mean, it shouldn't find it so shocking. But every time a receipt comes to the table, doesn't matter what kind of restaurant, they always ask, you know, who who they should be. You know, in, in America, they always hand the guy the bill, right? right. And uh, in Quebec, they're always like, who who should I give this to? <laughs> you know, really. Yeah. Or would you like to split this? I mean, that's just sort of like normal because it's very like, you know, a progressive culture that's very like, I think it's true now they're saying that uh, at least in Quebec now, uh, two thirds of all new doctors and lawyers are women. So actually they will be the breadwinner, bread, bread winners of the near future. So, I mean, uh, you know, depends where you are in Quebec. That's the way it's done in other places. Uh, it definitely wouldn't be done that. I think Japan, the tradition is the oldest man at the table always picks up the tab. So you look around hoping someone's older than you. <laughs> Who's it? Let me see some ID. <laughs> yeah, like, more gray hair than me, right? <laughs> so, uh, wait, wait, what year were you born? No, oh, you're a couple years older than me. Yeah, sure, I'll take out. Let's go to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That is fun. I, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm really taking advantage at this point because You've been all over the world. You've released this film. You have 30, what, 30? You said 30 plus projects coming? Uh, something like that, yeah. Well, I, I'm developing you. You know, every, every time I get a new idea, I write out a, a pitch deck for it and uh, see who it fits with. And uh, different organizations want different takes on it. Like one of the show, one of the company or one of the you know, shows is a thing called uh, The Nature of Things, which is a big science show in uh, in Canada that's been going for like 60 years, there's always the science. And I met a guy the other day is doing his PhD on the science of masochism that he's discovered the genetic, certain people have a genetic predisposition to being somewhat massive. They literally feel pain differently. So then now they can kind of find like people that have high or low thresholds or actually don't feel it as a painful thing. And other people that feel more, they've discovered that and explains a lot why masochists will often say that they it feels they feel pleasure when they're when anyone else would be feeling pain and they may have found a genetic reason for this and that might make an episode for a science show <laughs> wow. you know? how you know? do you how do you feel relationships and and modern love and dating has changed what do you what do you what do you think the future holds when it comes to to modern love now that you've with all your experience yeah yeah i think it's it's now you shouldn't judge someone too quickly. This should probably always been like this, but you know, uh, when you're young, people will often kind of have a lot of preconceived ideas and maybe, you know, assuming this and assuming that don't assume things, ask, you know, do that, you know, um, recognize that, you know, there may be a, a norm within your group, but that's not always the case. And just to be open and have conversations and not to judge people. Cause okay, maybe, uh, you know, the money thing's a classic one, I suppose. It's like, okay, I, you, you guys decided to go on this. She could be a millionaire heiress and you're, a, you know, a starving filmmaker. Or whatever. <laughs> okay, let her pay for dinner. What the hell? And not, a, not feel bad about that, not feel awkward about that if, that if that's genuine. But, you know, she may still judge you that way or maybe not judge you. I don't know. But just to be open to anything and any kind of roles and uh, not to... Not, not, not to get wrapped up in any of these preconceived ideas or sets of rules. They're, again, they're useful starting points that certain behaviors and certain are useful kinds of rules. But most of it is is arbitrary. You know, right. it's useful to know where to start, but most of them are so arbitrary. And in Hungary, a woman must always walk on the right of a man, else she's a whore. So every Hungarian woman knows it. Almost no one knows why. It, it fascinated me so much. I had to research why. 
And it's because in the old days, all men of substance would carry a sword and the safe side is on the right shoulder. If someone's got a sword, so hmm. you were protected on this side and you were in danger on the other side. So it was just that. Where in, in our culture, uh, most English cultures, Emily Post is to protect from the road. It's kind of a cult. It's just arbitrary and there's different rules for all of this stuff. Why we do these things, half of them don't make any sense. Opening a door for a person, opening a door for a lady. In some cultures, that's seen as very rude. A man should go first and make sure it's safe. It's a good argument, actually, don't you think? That's a fair argument. Now, it's a fair argument. Uh, I mean, why do we opening the door for a lady, letting go for... Um, there are Viking cultures, I believe, that would always do that because if they killed the woman, at least they only got her. They would always <laughs> let the woman go first because she, in their, their cultures, is first to get killed was the first out the door. It's safe. They didn't take my woman. Okay, now we'll go out. It's quite dark, actually, to let her. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Go ahead. It. Here you go. Uh, let me open the door for you, sweetie. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, I get it, that that's sort of like, but gay, how do you like, you like this, I will do this for you, if this is something you like, but I'm not going to assume it, uh, and different cultures the same, and uh, it's also interesting, your conversations about, uh, you know, yeah, my grandmother always had said that, we never heard why, well, that was probably because she had knowledge that she, your mother and father didn't really think it was important, but there was value in that knowledge, maybe it got lost because of the the shiny new culture, but there was probably value in certain thoughts and why things were done. I always like to say, like, I don't know how much time you spend in Africa, but I love how in Africa, if, if somebody's house burns down, usually in these small, almost anywhere in, in central or south, uh, someone's house burns down, all their strength, everyone in the village practically, whether they know them or not, comes over the next day and helps them build a new house and brings them pots and pans and gets them going again. I love that. You know, it's kind of a very sort of, socialist kind of approach for lack of a better word and but that's their whatever we're here we're like well yeah the government hopefully that person insurance you know really what's better right. what's a better system right. and we think they're poor and we're rich no we're just detached right. i think we, we could learn a lot from being more connected to our neighbors and at least having that response that respect for our neighbors you know so just because something's not successful financially doesn't mean it's not successful yeah, that's again a whole other thing. About <laughs> our whole culture is based on money right now. It's like, okay, if you're financially successful, you're right. Okay. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, well, true. apparently, I mean, it's basically yeah. kind of what we're what we're going at right now. If you're right, or you're true, or you're smart, you must be rich. You know, <laughs> or you're rich, so I must listen to you. I need exactly. to listen to you because clearly you're doing something right because you have money. Yeah. Right. So you're if, and conversely, if you're living in a little, you know, hut or something in the north in traditional ways, you know, there must be something wrong with you. You know, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's not there's some serious uh, knowledge there. There's some serious history, some serious lessons. I mean, Canada, we're going through a lot of that right now. I realize we didn't treat our First Nations people very well. And the whole generation of trying to, you know get them to be more like us was horrific and now we're realizing you know the knowledge and the especially to do with the land and preservation of the land and history that we need to learn to to respect and these people for the most part didn't did, didn't stray away from these ideas you know so, so true so true yeah. sir this has been an epic epic conversation this has been absolutely incredible thank i can't thank you enough for no making problem. time today this year. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Hey, we are, unfortunately, y'all, we are out <laughs> of time. We have to let... Speaking of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> we have to let it go. Very incredible, very impactful conversation. Sir, I want to say this to you publicly. Don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. Thank you for what you do. Of course not. Thank you for breaking the mold. Thank you for pushing past barriers. And thank you for exploring the taboo and and bring and making it a little bit more normal because that's that's what it is right that's how we that's how we grow that's how we learn and that's how we do better so impactful and how can we connect with you can you say it one more time how can we find you and, and explore and stay with you touch kink.com there you go and uh, just put your email in the newsletter list and you'll get a newsletter from me once a month about this film and uh, my new films and I'm, uh, I'm also looking for people to be in some of the new projects too so just to, if you're interested in kink and sex positivity please get on my mailing list 
Absolutely. For our audio listeners, that's touchkink.com. Check it out. Take a look and watch the film. Super, super mm-hmm. powerful. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope this message was was insightful, educational. And it was for me. It opened my eyes to a whole new mind shift. And that's that's the goal of this show. And that's what we do here at Gentleman Style. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you have gained something and grow from this. And travel. That's that's another thing. Travel. Explore the world. See what's out there. You'll be pleasantly surprised. Like we end every show. Take care of your friends. Take care of your family. And always, always take care of business. This is Marcus, your favorite gentleman, and Mr. Max Kiri of Touch Kink, changing and breaking the mold. Huge, huge, huge. Bye now. Love you guys. Thank you.